<laughs> Sorry, my name is Craig, I'm from Glasgow. Um, my question is, if we go independent, uh, we would have a, a surplus of finance and income. Where would you see that being used most beneficially for Scotland? Very, very good, Craig. I'm glad you've raised that point because I was involved in a debate recently with Michael Buffon, Patillo and the BBC uh, in Edinburgh. And after I'd made a few points about independent Scotland and how we were going to invest in new houses, how we're going to invest in proper schools, how we're going to invest in community hospitals. The bold Michael said, yeah, but what Mr. Sheridan doesn't understand, of course, in an independent Scotland, they'll lose the subsidies from England. <laughs> I must not laugh at you. He's sitting there in these tartan trousers. By the way, what a joker. Because what we have to explain to these people is for the last 33 years in a row, 33 years, no three, no four, no five, 33 years in a row, we, Scotland, have paid more into the Exchequer than we've got back from the Exchequer. We are starting off as a country with a surplus, as Craig has said, and as far as I'm concerned, Craig, there are many areas that we need to invest in, but one of the priorities must be good quality local authority housing so that we get rid of slum landlords, we get rid of slum housing. That's where we should be spending the money. Uh, you know, Tommy, just for a second, it was great hearing you speak without an accent. <laughs> uh, Colin yeah. from Inverness. Who's next, please? Colin um, from Inverness, yes. Just quickly, Tommy. Uh, obviously, your su the success that your tour has had and the success of the Radical Independence campaign has shown that there's a real hunger for left-wing politics in Scotland. Where do you think the future of left-wing politics is in Scotland after the referendum? Conor, I think politics in Scotland after the referendum is going to be very, very colourful, it's going to be very, very bright, and it's going to be very, very dynamic. The truth is we have awakened a whole new generation of people who are now interested in their country's future. They're not going back to bed on the 19th of September. They're going to want to be involved in something. I hope there will be a broad base spectrum of political ideas that everybody can feed into, that everybody can become part of. Quite frankly, it's not important to me right now who it is or what it is that we've got after 18th of September. The most important question right now is getting a yes vote on the 18th of September. Then we can discuss the details after the 18th of September. Thank you. Next question. Your name, please, your and question. Um, I'm Gillian. I'm from Dunblane. Gillian um, what? Boyd. Yes. And from where? From? Dunblane. Dunblane. Thank you. Your um, question. I'm a nurse. I work for the health service. I'm also a mother. And my my concerns about independence is I've got two young children. I'm also an aunt to uh, older teenagers who are struggling to get into university just now because we don't have fees. And what they're finding is that people from other country, countries are coming. The question is, if we have independence, is that going to stop the, the influx of foreign students coming in to pay uni university fees? My concern is my 10 year old, who's a bright 10 year old, if she's going to have a university place in the future. Thanks very much, Gillian. I hope everyone heard that. But Gillian has got fears about the future of her children in relation to whether they're going to be able to get into university in the future. I think the point that Gillian's trying to make is that some of the Scottish universities just now are more than willing to bend over backwards to invite overseas students into their institutions so they can charge them fees. It's a very, very legitimate question. In an independent Scotland, we will be able to fund our university and our tertiary sector because the colleges have been underfunded for far too long because of the cuts for Westminster that will then guarantee constitutionally no written in the back of a fag paper because in an independent Scotland we're going to have a written constitution that guarantees that guarantees our health service remains public that guarantees that every child is given the opportunity to get further and higher education and that every citizen of Scotland gets the chance of education training or a job written in our constitution. That's the difference, Gillian. And we, as a very, very rich, small nation, we are able to afford that. Even without oil and gas, financial times, standard and poor, or the big financial 
organisations that analyse the ins and outs of the economy have estimated that without oil and gas, Scotland would be a top 20 nation in the world. With oil and gas, we'd be the top five in the world. That's the reality of an independent Scotland. Next question, yes. Hello. Your name, please, and yeah. the question. Hi, Tommy. I'm Gillian from Women for Independence, Aberdeen. I'm not going to ask you a political question. I'm going to ask you what your preference is for our Scottish national anthem, given that the one we've got now is a little bit backwards looking. And was written by somebody from Gordonston. Do you know what? You know, I, I we've got a current referendum under way just now. I'd like to see another referendum after independence on that question. I've got to say I'm undecided. But... I'm undecided. I can be persuaded. I love, I love all of the Scots way he words. I love the mention of the great John McLean, but I also love Dignity by Deacon Blue. And I, I think there's something beautiful in that song because I think an independent Scotland will be a very dignified independent Scotland. And will be a Scotland. It will be a Scotland that we can be proud of because it will stand for peace. And imagine with an independent Scotland just now, it would be a Scotland that would be expelling the Israeli ambassador from Scotland and would be going to Israel from a genocide against the Palestinian people. I don't need pay to do this. I would pay money for this job. I love it. Who's the next question? Hello, um, I'm Keith from Glasgow. Um, can I just throw a man's a man's in before we go any further? Um, I'm a secondary school teacher in Irvine, North Ayrshire, and uh, I see kids. I don't want your CV. I want the question. Yeah, okay. I see kids leaving all the time with no real prospects. I'm a 100% yes for it. But what is your vision for how could we create more job opportunities for normal working class kids, skilled, potentially not? want to go to university but skilled kids, how do we create more jobs for them? Connor, was it? Keith, 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 sorry. Keith, I think it's very, very simple here. That we in an independent Scotland have to address the needs of our country. We have a housing shortage. We have the ability to create and produce clean energy because we have 25% of the whole of Europe's wind, wave and solar energy production resources. Why don't we have the idea in our heads that instead of having housing shortages and overcrowding and housing waiting lists, we actually have a mass house building programme that creates jobs for your joiners, for your brickies, for your quantity surveyors, for all of the trades. And we look at the skilled engineering that's required for the turbines, for the wind, the wave and the solar power. And we then look further and say, wait a wee minute, if we're going to have a public transport system that relies on trains and buses and trams, where are we going to make them? Why don't we make them in Scotland? In order to make them, we need steel. Why don't we have steel production? If we're going to have trade with the rest of Europe, why don't we have ships that are merchant trading ships instead of bloody war ships? Why don't we invest in civilian? in civilian shipbuilding instead of war ships. All of those areas, all of those areas are open to us. Right. All we need to do is open up our hearts and open up our heads. Excellent. Thank you, Tommy. Ne next quick. We have two more questions. Oh, Tommy, my name is Mike Robb from the Labour Party of Inverness. And I was speaking for no thanks earlier on this afternoon. But I've just got one question for you. I'm on the left of the Labour Party. I agree with a lot of what you're arguing for about Trident, benefits, all of this. But my question is this. Why, why are we not arguing for all those things right across the UK instead of cutting ourselves off and abandoning a lot of working people in the north of England? Is it, was it Keith? Was it Keith? Sorry, was it Keith? Mike, Mike, I'm very, very glad you've raised that question. I don't know if you heard Billy Bragg earlier. And he gave his last, he gave his last comment. And it was a comment I'm going to use at all my meetings because what I usually say is that we are not abandoning the working class of England. On the contrary, we are leading the working class of England. We're leading them because, because everything 
can we do in an independent Scotland to defend and expand the public services, to promote public ownership, to introduce a living wage instead of a poverty wage? We are going to show the working class of England that there is an alternative to the neoliberal economic madness that they have in Westminster. And just, just, just as Billy Bragg says, when the neighbours start doing something that's quite good, the other neighbours look over the fence and they think, oh, that's no bad, I'll have some of that. That's what's going to happen. The working class of England, who are asleep just now, because they have been so demotivated. Who the hell? Who the hell would allow Ed Miliband to run a bloody bath for you? Never run a country for you. Come on! Come on, let's make it up here. And we'll do it. And we'll do it. And we'll do it. And what you, and what you the Labour Party, cannot answer. And brother, I've been there. I know the pain you're going through. I know it. The working class never abandoned the Labour Party. The Labour Party abandoned the working class. The last question, man, and then I'll ask you to summarise. The last question, please. Who's the last question from? Yes, sir, your question. Your name, please. My name is Tony Gorky, and I'm from Glasgow. I'm a fervent yes supporter. I'd like to ask Tommy, um, I know it's your favourite subject, but I'd like to take it back. You spoke earlier about the press. Do you think it's any coincidence that of 78 mainstream um, publications that only one has come out for the yes? And also, do you think there's any coincidence that 78% of MPs are supposedly millionaires? I think, Tony, quite clearly, the press that we have is in this country is neither free nor democratic, despite what they say. It's a bit like Gandhi, isn't it? It's a bit like Gandhi when he arrived in Britain and the press said to him, what do you think of civilization? And he said it would be a good idea. <laughs> Here we have the really, really last oh, question because yeah, yeah. this guy's okay. had his hand up. Okay. And we've got two minutes to go, so. Hi, Tommy. Uh, Paul from Dangle. Paul, Paul your second name, please. Paul White. Yeah. Uh, You've been preaching the converted here, Tommy. It's been fantastic. It's been fantastic. Are you going to go out into the fields and speak to all the young folk who need to hear this message tonight? Tony, yeah. I'll speak anywhere where anybody wants to listen. That's the truth of the matter. I'm one of these guys who can't get to shut up as Maxwell's found out. I want to, can I sum up here? Is it all right? You can do whatever you like. I, I'm going to sum up, folks, by saying it's very, very important that we do try and communicate, particularly with the young people, but with everyone. The elderly, I've got to say, are probably more frightened than anybody right now. They are being fed the line from Project Fear that their pensions are under threat. A lot of lies. That their NHS is under threat. Aye, it is if they vote no. But they think it's under threat if they vote yes. We need to communicate with people and we need to get them to stop being frightened and to start raising their sights about what a potential exists for an independent Scotland. I want to finish with this, brothers and sisters, with a wonderful question from Gillian about our anthem in an independent Scotland. And I'm not going to suggest this as an anthem, but I want you to think of this in relation to the way that the press and the multi-millionaires and everybody else tells you, we're not big enough, we're not good enough, we're not rich enough, we're not smart enough to run our own affairs. I want you to bear in mind the words of the Labby Sifri song, something inside so strong. Yeah. Brothers, brothers and sisters, when they insist we're just not good enough, when we know better, just look them in the eyes and say, we're gonna do it anyway. Yeah. Thanks very much. He's got to go, but this is the shortest, this is the shortest thank you speech. This is the shortest thank you speech I've ever given in my life. I love this man. I think you do too. Ladies and gentlemen, Tommy Sheridan.
ありがとうございます。